Hey, what's up gamers? Sorry for the pause since my last video. I've decided to finish my Atari 2600 game and make a video afterwards. I figured there would be no point of making more videos where I talk about some small cosmetic changes in the game or how I saved one byte of RAM. So this video is going to conclude my quest of making an Atari 2600 game. If you remember, the last time I already had a somewhat playable game, but there was still something missing. The game did not seem very interesting and fun. It felt more like a chore to play it. I wanted to deepen my game design skills and fix it. I naively believed that if I read some smart book, I would magically find a way to improve the game. I started reading The Art of Game Design. The Book of Lenses by Jesse Schell. It wasn't the first time I tried to read this book. I gave it a try like 10 years ago, but for some reason I wasn't able to finish it. While I was reading the book now, a particular sentence caught my attention. It stated that the fun is a pleasure with surprises. That got me thinking, perhaps I should add more surprises to my game. But what should I add? What about those boulders that I had in the prototype? They seemed like a surprise, but I've decided not to include them. I guess they were somewhat unfair, since they appeared randomly and there were no way to avoid them. And according to the book, unfair elements are a bad design practice. The other thing that seemed tempting and definitely surprising was the idea that I had in my previous video. To add a hidden prize that freezes the lava for some time. I had two problems though. No free memory to store the coordinates of this prize and no free CPU cycles to draw it. Or so I thought once again. I managed to free some bytes by storing the score in a BCD format. BCD stands for the binary coded decimal. I haven't mentioned before, but the six digit score was stored in an array of six bytes, where each byte was an index of another array that stored the addresses of the number graphics. The BCD format lets you store the same thing, but only in three bytes, because every digit is encoded in four bits. Also the 6507 CPU has a special mode that lets you operate the BCD numbers. So this way I freed up 3 bytes. It was more than enough for the special price coordinates. Also I succeeded to get some CPU cycles to draw a player 1 missile sprite as a prize. The only problem with missiles is they take the same color as the player sprite. So I had to adjust the player colors and to make sure the missile height is correct. Even though I said I prefer the all white character sprite, I did not want to completely remove colors from it. So I just colored the pants and belt. The price usually grabs the color of the pants. When the character is on the same row as the price, the price looks yellowish. But if the player leaves the price, the price turns white because it took the color of the last character's scan line. The prize is invisible until you find it. Basically you have to be on the same row and few tiles away from it. This brought a little bit of exploration spirit to the game. When the player collides with a missile prize, the lava freezes for some time and lets you escape. Plus you get some extra points for that. It is very beneficial in later rooms when the lava gets really fast. After I was finished with a price, I noticed that I ran out of RAM. What now? Not sure if you recall, but the playfield had these registers that took only 4 bits. So two data columns in game and lava maps had only half of the bytes used. I found a way to bring all those 4 bits back into the action. Using the overlays I was able to create a ton of variables that could store up to 16 values. The only downside was that after loading those variables you had to execute an AND instruction. 
to invalidate upper bits. Also, you have to make sure when you save the variable, those upper bits are intact. Of course, sometimes I made mistakes and they were visible on the lava and ground tiles. Every complete game has to have a title screen. I drew the game's name with playfield bricks and created some primitive color animation. The most crucial feature of this screen was the score. Because while focused on the game, I tended to miss out the amount of points I collected during the game when the game was over. Now I can see my score in all its glory. I started to play more and tracked how many points I get. I've noticed that I usually get the same amount, around 800 points. It was almost impossible to go beyond that and it was quite hard to get much less. So I've decided to spice things up by increasing the lava speed gradually in the same room. Previously the lava speed increased only when you entered a new room. But now it increases over time. So that means the more time you spend in the same room, the faster the lava will get to you. I think this change resulted in more varied scores. Although my top scores were still a bit similar. Another brief decision was to hide all the ladders. At first I made that the game draws only the ladders you have found. So when you enter a new room, you have no idea where the ladders are. Previously you saw all the ladders and just mindlessly ran from one to another. Now I think it is more interesting and more challenging as well. Unfortunately this feature increased the complexity of the drawing code. So I had to skip another scanline for each map row. Talking about the score, I finally figured out how to center and properly draw it. So all the digits can be changed. The documental source of Riverid helped me a lot to do that. Apparently the timing when you set the graphics for each digit changes when you change the horizontal position of the sprites. According to the book, the score in your game or any element really shouldn't be just for the sake of being there. It should have some purpose and meaning as well. So I made that if the lower third score digit changes to 5, you get an extra life. So you get lives when you collect 500, 1500, 2500 and so on. So now you're not just mindlessly collecting points. But also your score might prolong your survival. I wasn't done with the ladders yet. I modified the drawing code so it would draw only one ladder sprite. This helped me to simplify the code and reduce the scan lines on the screen. The next improvement was the lives indicator. Now it supports up to 6 dudes. I'm not sure if anyone will be able to accumulate so many lives, but you are free to try. Another attempt to add variety to the scores was to increase the power of the special price with the amount of the completed rooms. I hoped it will help leverage the increasing lava speed. And finally I added a possibility to mine the lava when it's frozen. It's somewhat risky endeavor so you get some extra points for each lava brick. This caused some problems, so I had to add a subroutine that fixes the lava's position after it was mined. It still doesn't work perfectly though. Related to that, I had to implement a feature that lets the lava overflow closed spaces when it's trapped. So now there is no escape from the lava. Since it's not clear where your ghoul is located in the room and it's too difficult to draw more stuff on the screen, I've decided to add another exit point on the left side of the screen. So you could exit the room not only by moving to the bottom right corner, but also to the left. The new exit point creates another room that's orientated a bit differently. I could not wait to add some copyright logo and year number to the title screen. It's magical to see 2022 in a game 
that is made for a 45 year old system. I told to myself it's going to be the final feature in this game. For this task I drew 48 pixel wide bitmap. This is probably the only possibility on the 2600 to draw some high res graphics. It is basically the same as the 6 digit score number but a bit simpler since you don't need to use pointers. Although it took me a lot of time to draw everything correctly. So now I can finally enjoy my game on the real 2600. After a few attempts of trying to beat my high score, my thumb started to hurt real bad. So I decided to hook up the Sega Mega Drive gamepad. But once it was connected, the game started glitching. I was very surprised how a gamepad can break the game when majority of official titles work just fine with it. Apparently the reason of this glitch was really simple. I just forgot to add a hash sign before constant names in a few places. I discovered the Stella emulator has a cool feature that can help you to find typos like this. You need to set the developer mode and activate the drive and use TIA pins randomly on read slash peak. So that was it. Now the game feels somewhat finished. Or at least it feels like a proper alpha version. Looking back to my first episode I stated that the 2600 is a great system to design something unique and possibly fun because the system is so limited. Strangely enough, I made my prototype without doing much research of what the 2600 can do. I tried really hard to push this exact prototype to work on the 2600. So I guess it seemed that my actions are contradictory to what I was preaching. Still, I was affected by the limitations. When I tried to make the game more interesting and expand it beyond the basic gameplay mechanics. I realized that I can do much anymore. For instance, on PC I could have easily added several additional power-ups or some actions to the player's character. But on the 2600 I could not do that. It was hard enough to draw this yellow brick as a special prize. It would have been even harder to add something more. So I had to think what else can I change instead of drawing more sprites. Was this beneficial? Mm, maybe. It is hard to tell. Another contradiction was that I stated that the game must not require any manuals. But it seems my game is not that obvious without any explanations. Would you know where is the exit in the room? Would you try to mine the lava when it stays still? Would you even know you can get an extra life by collecting 500 points? Probably not. I'm not sure I was correct when I stated that I ran out of CPU cycles for the vertical blank and overscan periods. I came to this conclusion when the sprites in the game started glitching. In reality you can cram way more code there than I had back then. When you hit the limit of vertical blank and overscan. It doesn't just affect sprites. The whole screen widely shakes as if your TV is about to be turned off. It was also dumb for me to state that subroutines are evil, since you can't do much without them when your code gets more complex. If I'm gonna make another game on this platform, I would definitely investigate a way to add additional RAM to the cartridge. The RAM was one of the biggest limits. Although it depends on the type of game you're making. For sure the grid based games where you can affect the environment are not the best fit for the 2600. Apparently even old games like Dig Dug had an external RAM in the cartridge. The ROM on the other hand wasn't a problem at all. There is still about 500 bytes left free. Anyway, I'm happy that I managed to make something working on this platform since it was way harder than I was expecting. 
So I definitely exercised my brain and also improved 6502 assembly skills. And most importantly, I have my own game on this cottage instead of some pirate drums. Will I be improving my game in the future? I don't know, maybe? Sure, there is still many things that could be done, like the PAL version, perhaps a congratulations screen after you completed each room, but it's no longer that exciting for me. So probably I won't dwell on this game and start making something new, maybe even on an entirely different platform. As always, you can find the games ROM and its source code on my Git repository on GitHub. I've put the links in the description. And if you're interested in what's going to be my next project and what old system I'm gonna explore, then subscribe so you won't miss my upcoming videos. So thanks for watching and hopefully see you next time. Bye!